Hello, everybody. This is Jake Wynn, Director of Interpretation at the National Museum of Civil War Medicine and Clara Barton Missing Soldiers Office Museum with my colleague, Kyle Dalton. How are you doing today, Kyle? Doing great. How about yourself? Doing good. Doing good. Enjoying a, a lovely Thursday afternoon here at the Missing Soldiers Office Museum in D.C. I can see you're in your wonderful kitchen. Uh, a, a yes. scene that we have seen so many times since the pandemic has started. Yeah, I thought about getting a green screen, but I feel like it's a little iconic now uh, for our audience. So uh, really, I'm just trying to do better lighting. <laughs> yes. So, well, welcome, everybody, uh, to our first ever YouTube stream. So this has been an adventure already. Uh, I feel like uh, I have learned a lot and had a few uh, frights. Uh, thinking that I was live when I wasn't, uh, being live when I thought I was, or when I thought I wasn't. Uh, so thank you all for, for bearing with us, and hopefully this will go as seamlessly as possible. Uh, we do plan on utilizing our YouTube channel uh, more frequently uh, in the future uh, to uh, deliver content to all of you. So uh, for those of you who've been tuning in and uh, to our videos over on Facebook Live. Uh, this is gonna be a new place that we will share some of our videos, um, try to bolster our audience here and, and keep it growing. Um, YouTube is a tremendous platform uh, for uh, historical institutions and nonprofits to utilize. And so we want to, uh, to, to put a foothold here as well uh, in order to, uh, to bring content to all of you out there and, and maybe gain some new uh, audience members as well. I uh, will say, if you are enjoying these videos uh, that we have been putting out, uh, you can help us here uh, by uh, liking the video uh, and uh, giving us that thumbs up uh, and also going and down underneath the video and subscribing to our YouTube channel. So this is uh, an area where we are going to be producing more content, sharing more content. Uh, we are excited to do that, to, to to uh, expand our audience here as well um, with the, all the wonderful tools that YouTube has available for us. So today we are going to be doing uh, another uh, kind of historic happy hour video. Uh, Kyle and myself did one of these videos back uh, earlier in 2020. Uh, we decided it would be a good idea to come back around on this to talk specifically about beer in the Civil War. So uh, I got myself a uh, one of my favorite beers of all time. Uh, I am drinking a uh, Cujo cold brew coffee porter uh, from Flying Dog Brewery in uh, good old Frederick, Maryland. Um, so this is, uh, this is the beer that I'm going to be uh, uh, sipping on during our program. Uh, Kyle, what did, do you have anything uh, that you're drinking there? Yeah, I've got a Witness Tree Brown Ale, uh, Antietam Brewing. We sell this in our gift shop. Uh, we are open Saturday and Sunday uh, in Frederick. So come on by uh, 10 to 5 on Saturday, 11 to 5 on uh, Sunday. Uh, we are one of the few museum gift shops that is well stocked with beer. So you can uh, try one of these for yourself. I like the, the Brown Ale a lot. And uh, if you stick around to the end, uh, we, we got a special announcement uh, about uh, the, the beers that we carry in our, our gift shop. So stay around to the end of the video. We've got some exciting news. Yes. So we are uh, a museum with a liquor license. We do sell beer in our store. It is awesome. Kyle's got the great pour going on right now. Uh, I will say that uh, the Antietam, Antietam beer, just like the Flying Dog beer, uh, which is a, a partner that we've also worked with at the museum. Uh, excellent, excellent stuff. So uh, good, good things for us to be sipping on during the program today. So we're going to be talking about various aspects of beer uh, during the Civil War. We're going to talk about kind of its origins, uh, how what, what beer is being consumed, uh, how much is being consumed during the Civil War. We're going to talk a little bit about, of course, intoxication in the Civil War and some of the stigmas and, um, and also the health problems that that can cause. Um, and we'll also talk about as we feel very strongly about uh, medicinal beer um, and beer uh, being used during the Civil War as a nutritional supplement uh, for, for wounded and sick soldiers uh, and some of the values uh, that beer provided to Civil War soldiers and medical personnel during the conflict. 
Um, before we come back around, as Kyle mentioned, to a uh, special announcement for those of you watching with us uh, today on YouTube, uh, that you'll get some insider information about another upcoming beer partnership. Um, so we're really excited about that. Uh, before we jump in fully, I uh, do want to uh, do a, a brief little pitch uh, to become a member of the National Museum of Civil War Medicine. And uh, we have the perfect person uh, to talk about membership and some of the fundraising campaigns that we have going on right now at the museum uh, with Kyle Dalton. So Kyle, do you want to talk a little bit about, uh, about your job, what you do, and, uh, and how people can help us out? Sure. Yeah, the best way to help is to become a member. Members are the people who support us. They give a little bit every year uh, and that gets uh, them certain benefits. Uh, if you become a member today, you'll get a subscription to our journal and our newsletter. We got a new journal coming out here, uh, I think just in a week or two. Um, you get 10% off in all of our gift shops at all three of our locations. You get free admission to all three locations. Uh, and you get a coupon on top of that to spend in the gift shop, which you can use on the beers that we're featuring today. Uh, so uh, there's a lot of benefits to it. We, we like to thank you for, for supporting us. It is the best way to support. If you're already a member or if you don't want to make the yearly commitment, which I totally understand, um, check out the link uh, below. Uh, that link is going to go to our appeal uh, we are raising money. Uh, we, we are raising money to help with the shortfall caused by the pandemic. We had to close our doors for 180 days this year. Uh, that is a lot. We used to be seven days a week. Uh, so it, it, we did take kind of a hit here. Um, and we've reached out to multiple sources. We've earned some grants. Uh, our members have been very generous. Uh, but if you want to help just a little bit more, then uh, be sure to check out that link below. Uh, any little bit helps. Uh, and it is tax deductible. Uh, you'll get a letter, you can claim it on your taxes. Uh, so consider a membership. If you're already a member, uh, consider uh, contributing to uh, our, our ask this year. Um, and uh, really, if you can't afford either of those, that's fine, enjoy the video. Uh, just glad that, that you're here, glad you're having fun with us. Uh, and final piece of housekeeping, we are not medical professionals. We are not doctors, we're not nurses. We do not have medical training. Uh, we are talking purely history here. Uh, so take nothing that we say as medical advice. Yes, that is always, uh, always good that Kyle throws that in there. Uh, that we both come from a history background. So yeah, medical advice from us, trust me, you don't want to do that. Um, so uh, with all of that being said, uh, one more pitch uh, that I'll, I'll throw in here before we, we get into our content. Again, those of you who have joined, we have about 24 people watching live so far, so not too bad for our first YouTube stream. Uh, you can help us by uh, hitting the, uh, the, the thumbs up button. Give us a thumbs up if you like the video. That'll help more people see it uh, and, uh, and join in the fun. Uh, subscribe to the channel if you want more videos like this one. We are going to be doing more of these in the future. Uh, and you can share the video as well. There's a sharing option uh, that you'll find under the, uh, the video screen as well. Um, That'll help more of your friends and family and uh, fellow history lovers, uh, allow them to, to see what we're doing and to join in the fun. So all that being said, let's talk about beer in the Civil War. So Kyle, what is the, uh, what is the situation? What are Americans drinking in the mid 19th century? Well, the mid 19th century is sort of the tail end of most of British North America and then the United States, most of their um, drinking culture. So when the Brits first lay uh, land here uh, in the colonies, uh, spirits are by far the thing most people are drinking. Wine comes next and then beer and cider. Uh, cider is even more popular than beer. Uh, you're seeing a lot of that in the colonial era. When you get to uh, the beginning of the federal era, that is the end of the American Revolution, where we've created the Constitution, we're heading into sort of the, the norms of uh, an American Republic. And in that era, you start seeing the emergence of cocktails. You start seeing them go from big punch bowls, or in like the 17th century, they'd have these uh, cups with multiple handles. You're all drinking out of the same vessel. Uh, and they're going to individual glasses that are made just for you. It's becoming a much more individualistic society. Uh, and also that's cleaner and, you know, not as gross. Uh, so there's still 
in that mode, they're still very much interested in spirits above everything else. Cocktails have started to emerge. You're seeing more of them. They're seen as an explicitly democratic uh, drink. They're seen as linked with elections, with a free society. Uh, wine is then sort of your next most popular, but it's still not that popular comparatively. And then you've got a little bit of beer. And in fact, there's a great illustration of this uh, that I'd like to share from uh, Vine Pair, uh, which uh, has a whole great article about the, consum the changing consumption of alcohol over time. And in this chart, you'll see the green area or blue, depending on what color your screen is, uh, that's spirits. And this chart starts in 1860. This starts at the beginning of the Civil War. So at the beginning of the Civil War, again, spirits are the thing everybody's drinking. Beer makes up less than 10% of what people are drinking. One thing that really surprised me is that uh, we drink the same amount of alcohol by gallon per capita that Americans did in the Civil War. We're drinking the same amount. It's just that they were drinking stuff that was much heavier. Uh, and we'll talk later about intoxication and why it was such a big deal. Um, but it's also a turning point because you see, this is the last time that beer consumption is that low. It explodes in the years after the Civil War. The Civil War is a turning point in the consumption of alcohol because a lot of people are getting exposed to new and different things. Oftentimes this is spirits. Uh, Maryland rye gets really popular after the Civil War because you've got armies of hundreds of thousands that are crisscrossing Maryland and that's what they have to drink. Uh, so Maryland rye becomes a national drink, that whiskey. Uh, but they're also getting exposed to other cultures, especially the Germans. Uh, Germans are the uh, largest, and Jake, you can correct me if I'm wrong on this. They're the largest uh, ethnic minority in the Union Army. Mm -hmm. yes. Yeah. And the, and then like the Irish are, are like number two, right? Yeah, so people are getting exposed to things that they hadn't been before, both from the places they're going and from the people they're interacting with. Uh, interestingly, while I was uh, doing research for today, I found this little gem. Uh, this is the service record of Adolphus Bush of Anheuser-Busch fame. Uh, he was a corporal, uh, served in a three-month regiment, the uh, 3rd Missouri Infantry, uh, and did actually see some action. He was at the Battle of Wilson's Creek uh, and may have been involved in uh, with his regiment in some of the sort of less uh, tasteful actions of Missouri. Missouri was a pretty nasty place at the time. Um, but he was discharged. He didn't uh, re-enlist. Uh, and he went back to his company that he started just before he signed up, Anheuser-Busch. That's, that's where it started. Uh, so the most popular beer, even to this day, even though it's lost a lot of its popularity, uh, by pure consumption, by pure uh, market share, is still Budweiser. Budweiser is, uh, actually, I have a, a fun little uh, reproduction of some of the original labels on there. Uh, Budweiser is a Czech-style lager through the lens of German Americans. It's a very strange drink and it was pretty different back then from how it tastes today. Um, but that uh, pretty quickly explodes in the wake of the Civil War. Here you have an actual Civil War veteran, a German representing this movement uh, and really bringing it to the fore. Uh, the, there is a lot of xenophobia that goes with that too. And that's one of the reasons that beer doesn't take off quite as quickly as perhaps it would have. Uh, we see this in illustrations of the time in political cartoons like this one, uh, in which the Irish and the Germans are defined by their national drinks. Uh, and again, you see that uh, this is seen as an undermining of American democracy. They're walking away with a ballot box. There's fighting at the polls. Uh, the cocktail, the spirits uh, that are especially locally made, like whiskeys, uh, those are seen as very American in the way that like Budweiser is now. Uh, but again, there's a shift there. The Civil War turns uh, things, starts to turn things to hinge point. Uh, and eventually beer becomes by far the most popular drink in America. But it starts with the Civil War and with the exposure of these groups uh, who are reviled, uh, exposure of them to people who otherwise wouldn't have met them. So that's sort of the long answer to your short question. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's interesting to see, you know, when we think of uh, some of the more iconic places 
that beer is made, St. Louis um, stands out as one. It was a, a center of German American immigration in the 1850s. Uh, but we also look at other places, other locations and locales that are known for beer. I, I think of Milwaukee, uh, Wisconsin yeah. is another one that uh, there is a, a massive influx of German immigrants in the mid part of the 19th century around uh, and during the Civil War era, uh, where we start to see uh, those folks moving in and bringing beer uh, along with them and, and the uh, knowledge and, and capabilities of making that beer and making German style beers, as you mentioned, the, the, the lager um, as, as being, in, and you saw it in the political cartoon. Um, and I, this makes me think, uh, and, and Kyle probably knows this is coming um, at, at some point here, but uh, I grew up just west of Pottsville, Pennsylvania. So Yingling um, is one of the uh, famous American breweries that uh, can date to this era of American history. Uh, opens its doors in 1829 um, to uh, provide uh, beer to, uh, to to coal miners and workers in, in my part of Pennsylvania and ultimately uh, goes on to actually uh, distribute some beer to uh, to some of the Civil War regiments that came from, from that area of the country. Um, so with this kind of uh, where we're at in terms of uh, talking about, you know, beer consumption and alcohol consumption, uh, I think this is a good time to talk a little bit about some of the, uh, it comes up a little bit with the, the political cartoon, uh, but alcohol of course has a stigma associated with it, uh, mostly because it's intoxicating. Um, so this is one of the, uh, the perils when it, comes to, uh, when, it, when it comes to alcohol and talking about alcohol in the Civil War era. It, it, is this, it does have benefits. Uh, we'll talk about some of those benefits medicinally, um, nutritionally. Uh, but it also has this downside, um, and it's going to launch many a moral crusade in the in the 19th and early 20th centuries, ultimately leading to prohibition. Um, but uh, let's talk a little bit about intoxication and how beer fits into this story. So I just want to to kind of jump in here, and I know um, Kyle and I kind of bounce back and forth with uh, with talking about this. Um, but uh, there is some some interesting. Civil War era uh, medical talk about intoxication and, and one of the famous manuals of medicine from the Civil War era comes from Dr. Samuel Gross. Um, Dr. Gross uh, was one of the elite minds in America medically um, at the time of the Civil War. He's based out of Philadelphia. Uh, he writes a, a very famous manual that is going to be distributed to, uh, to many uh, military surgeons and medical practitioners during the Civil War era and be used afterwards as well. Um, but this is what he, he writes in 1862. He says, no intemperance either in eating or drinking should be tolerated in an army. Both are demoralizing and both predisposed to, if not actually provoke disease. Um, so this is the danger um, of, of alcohol and its use during this time period. Um, but beer is actually uh, gonna be kind of utilized during the Civil War era because uh, it has some very specific properties that are going to kind of prevent some of the downsides of many uh, more high octane uh, alcoholic beverages during, during the, uh, the time of the Civil War. So Kyle, how alcoholic, uh, how, how high is the uh, alcohol content uh, uh, in these beers during the Civil War era? Uh, you know, I actually don't know that one, uh, <laughs> but I, I, uh, I know that it has to be below a certain percent today to be considered beer. And many of these rules go back to the 19th century when people were starting to standardize what uh, things could be. Um, that whole reason, the whole reason for the creation of Budweiser was that um, its creator, Carl, oh, his name escapes me. Carl, he went to Europe and he was touring Europe to get an idea of what different regions were doing with beer. Uh, he apparently didn't have a guidebook like you can get today. Uh, he didn't have the idea that this is what an India pale ale is. This is what a Kolsch is. This is the region it comes from. Here's how it's made. So he had to actually go to Europe to figure out what they were doing in Bohemia. Uh, he called it a Bohemian beer, uh, Bohemian lager. Um, so they, they did have certain requirements and it's definitely lower than the spirits they're drinking. 
Uh, some of these spirits are more alcoholic than spirits are today. Some of their whiskeys and gins were hitting harder than the stuff you'll get off the shelf in a local liquor store. Um, and that also, again, is uh, one thing I wanted to jump back to. Uh, in that quote, you use the word intemperance. Uh, and one thing kind of hovering over all studies of alcohol uh, is the temperance movement. Uh, and it is a quasi-medical movement. There's ideas that this is doing things to the body, that it's corrupting you, but they're all bound up with these non-medical ideas. Uh, the idea that this is not, or the idea that this is addiction is foreign to many of these people. They, they cannot conceive of it as a medical issue, and yet they're using medical terminology to describe it. Uh, so beer is seen as a mitigating force in that again, kind of quasi medical, um, but it is much lower la in alcohol. Uh, and maybe that's a way of, of weaning people off, uh, all the way up till prohibition in, uh, 1918, um, 19, 19, whatever it was, uh, <laughs> they, uh, were still thinking. In fact, some of the congressmen who voted for prohibition thought that wine and beer would be legal. They thought they were just banning spirits. Uh, so this is true in the civil war as well. People are seeing beer in some cases as a safer alternative. Yeah, that's exactly what I was, uh, was hoping you'd get out there, Kyle, is that the alcohol, uh, you know, has many, has uses during the war. We'll talk about that. Um, but beer, because of its low alcohol content compared to whiskey, compared to brandy, compared to gin, compared to all of these other uh, beverages that are available uh, during the Civil War time period and are widely consumed, uh, beer is much lower in that content, which means that you know, you have to drink a lot more of it before you start feeling uh, feeling those impacts. And also the fact that the beer that is being uh, consumed in this time period uh, is lower in alcohol content, um, lower in its intoxicating ways uh, than beer today. Um, it's it, and also it, it varied very much so uh, from uh brewery to brewery, and even barrel to barrel that it is placed into. Um, we'll talk a little bit about that um, in, in just a few minutes. I want to talk a little bit about some of the negative health benefits in terms of what happens when your beer is tainted. Um, it'll be a, uh, something that we'll talk about here. But I do want to, um, as Kyle was mentioned, mentioning about uh, kind of the, the moral aspect and the temperance movement um, that is going to take place. Uh, when it does come to beer in the Civil War and, and kind of some of the research and pulling together some of these primary sources that I have for all of you today, looking at what people are thinking about medically in, in regards to beer, uh, is that uh, there's a lot of moralizing around alcohol in the Civil War era because of this temperance movement. It is the, of the mid 19th century uh, behind, of course, the, the abolition movement uh, to, to end slavery. Um, and so when we look at this and we, we you begin to see some of the sources and a lot of where I was reading uh, online uh, and in print uh, from that time period, you see a lot of the uh, religious uh, documents, religious uh, periodicals are talking about the perils of things like lager beer saloons. Um, and so this comes up a lot, um, that it's not necessarily just the intoxication, it's not just the intemperance that comes with, with alcohol consumption, um, especially regular alcohol consumption. It's also the places in which it is consumed. Um, and so uh, the idea of these uh, saloons uh, where lager and beer is being uh, partaken are gonna have uh, negative stereotypes among many Americans. Um, and that's not necessarily because of the beverages that are consumed there, but it's oftentimes because of the clientele. And that goes back to what Kyle was mentioning earlier about very xenophobic era in American history as the, the nativist movement really kicks into high gear in the 1850s and anti-immigrant um, ideology is really going to be rampant in American politics. It's going to touch on all aspects of, of American life. Um, there's a party, uh, a, a political party based upon these ideas, the, the American party or the, the, the know-nothings as they are, as they are uh, known during that era kind of derisively. Um, 
you know, the, the beer saloon as a place where German Americans and German immigrants are going to gather and get together and consume these beverages are looked at with suspicion. They are looked at as places where people get together who aren't American, who don't speak English, who gather together and are going to be drinking these beverages. And that is of a suspicious character, even though um, these places are, are very much just kind of cultural carryovers from where these Germans came from in their native land and brought it to this country. And they were not places that are particular necessarily synonymous with violence or with, uh, with you know, uh, anti-religious ideology as, as many Germans are kind of painted with um, or uh, Protestant versus Catholic. All of these different fault lines in American society run through this conversation. Uh, and beer ends up getting caught in the middle of that, um, which is a, a really interesting aspect when we think of talking about beer in the Civil War, to talk about these cultural lines upon which it is going to, to touch uh, upon. It's just something very interesting to, to think about and to keep in mind when, we, when you're thinking about beer history uh, in, this, in this particular country. And now, I, think I do also, want to say, oh, go ahead, Kyle. Yeah, <laughs> uh, it, it's also more than just cultural and religious boundaries. It's everything. Um, Americans are moralizing over alcohol and they're putting all of their anxieties into it. Uh, everything that can be conceived of is being crowbarred into talking about temperance or prohibition or beer or whiskey. Uh, as I said, with the uh, explicit ties to our government, uh, individualism versus uh, communalism, um, immigration versus nativism. Uh, but you've also got racial uh, barriers there. Mm -hmm. Frederick Douglass uh, actually explicitly linked the temperance movement to the abolition movement. Uh, and in an 1845 speech in Ireland, he said, I believe that if we could make the world sober, we would have no slavery. All great reforms go together. Uh, it's obviously doesn't work that way, but in his mind, and he is one of the great reformers of the era, those two were explicitly linked. It's a lot harder for me to see how that works, uh, but he thought they were. Uh, and also going back to what uh, you were saying, Jake, about the beer halls, uh, about the saloons, one of the things people panic about is that it is a space where everyone from that community can gather. Women, children, uh, it, it comes across in this 19th century mind, 19th century Victorian American mind, as a space where people should not be gathering in that way. You should be separating the genders. You should be separating the generations. Uh, this should be a male exclusive space, which is interesting because in the early days of America in the colonial era, when everybody's drinking out of the same bowl, uh, taverns were a space where everyone gathered. Uh, enslaved and free, women and children, old and young. Uh, it, it was a true mixing area, and it was only through the 19th century that it moved away from that uh, and has stayed actually pretty far to that side until very recently. Now breweries are, once again, over the past 10, 20 years, places where everyone can gather. But there's a lot of anxiety about that in the 19th century. Uh, 1860s Americans are flipping their lid over it. Yeah, it's uh, when you look at kind of the, the origins, I think going back to the, the Germans specifically too, you know, uh, all of the suspicion that came at, at German Amer at German Americans or, or German immigrants. I, I come from an area where, you know, Pennsylvania Dutch is something that uh, is, is a, a very much a part of the culture uh, in the areas where, where I grew up. Um, but there was so much suspicion about this. And, and a lot of it I have found in, in kind of in some of my own research about the area in which I grew up too, is uh, and, and the idea of uh, a lot of these immigrants coming over as, as kind of uh, their, their ideologies, the, the pi political ideologies that they had. Um, these, in many cases, are revolution. Um, they participated as, as many of the immigrants in the 1840s and 1850s uh, in revolutions in their own countries, whether that be in Ireland, uh, Germany, all across Central Europe, moment, um, European uh, refugees from their countries on our shores. And many of them 
are going to be looked at uh, suspiciously as well. And it also goes to the, the folks coming over, especially for many, are, are what are known as thinkers. The, these ideas that, you know, not quite all the way to atheism, um, but the idea that uh, people have kind of begun to divorce themselves from the powers of the church, whether that be the Catholic church or Protestant churches as well. Um, and these beer halls, the saloons, these places are, are places where those communities gather as well. So, um, Again, these fault lines that are, are coming up in American society, whether based on, on immigration status, whether based on race, whether based on ideas and religion, uh, all come together in this issue. And we all come together around beer um, as being the kind of issue around which all of these, all of these things are, are being debated and, and in some cases actually physically fought out. Um, I, I do think it's important also that we point out that Intoxication is a very serious issue in 19th century America, like much worse than it is today. So while there are a lot of these anxieties and it is getting wrapped up with a lot of other things that it is and is not related to, there is actually an epidemic of alcoholism, a crippling one. Mm -hmm. uh, and it especially hurts lower class men. Uh, and because this is a society in which they're invested with a lot of power for their families, it has a massive ripple effects through society. Uh, so I don't want to, you know, downplay too much or say just because someone's in the temperance movement, they're xenophobic or they're misled because there is an actual serious issue in 19th century America. Yes. So let's, Thinking of, of, of intoxication, the problem that it created, I do want to touch on another negative aspect of, of beer during this time period, and that is actually the beer itself. Uh, so there is no real standard brewing practice. There, there are mainstay ideas about beer and how it is made. But just like medicine in that time period that we don't have a full understanding of the uh, microscopic world in which we, uh, which we all live in and, and lives on and inside all of us, uh, as goes to medicine and the lack of knowledge of germ theory, uh, the lack of understanding of how disease and infection work, this is very tied to how beer and alcohol are made. And so people did not have a full understanding of how what they were making worked, how it functioned, how making beer on a microscopic level worked. Uh, and this leads to a lot of issues when it comes to the quality of the beer, when it comes to uh, standardization, uh, meaning that basically uh, you could have two barrels made right next to each other of beer in the same brewery and their properties can be very different um, because of the, the minutest change in climate, um, in the ingredients that are being utilized, in the temperature of where it's being stored. And there is very little understanding of how all of these different elements are going to create the finished product. Just as when you go on a brew, brew tour today, a, a brewery tour or a um, you know, a, a tasting, talking about all of those different elements that go into making a beer and giving it the qualities and the flavors that it has. Uh, there is no understanding of any of that uh, during the mid 19th century. Um, and what this means is that beer, just like any other alcoholic beverage at this time, can be dangerous, in fact, to consume. Uh, this is going to become a big issue again uh, during the Prohibition era as people are making bathtub gin and people are making their own liquor uh, with little understanding of how they're actually, the, the, the different factors that go into it. You can end up making something that is dangerous to consume. Mid-19th century America is also uh, problematic um, because there are lots of products on the market um, that do not set are not made of what they say, say they're made of. Um, the ingredients just flat out lie. There's lots of claims that are out there. Patent, this is the age of patent medicine. Um, so that plays a part. And I, I saw Kyle, you, you have a, you had a comment there? Yeah, uh, actually uh, Emily uh, here, she does home brewing, uh, which I'm very lucky. Uh, but we were just talking to a brewer the other day, a professional brewer, not, not a uh, home brewer. Uh, and he specialized in heritage stuff. Uh, heritage oats, heritage this, heritage that, trying to make the kinds of drinks they would have made in the 18th, 19th century. 
And having some experience, we asked, uh, well, you know, sterilization is really important. To have sterilization, though, you got to have germ theory. You've got to have that medical theory that tells you this is what's making your beer funky. So how did they handle that back then? And his answer was basically they didn't. All of their beers were a little bit skunky. Like it just isn't as good as you think it is. <laughs> yeah, this is, uh, I, I remember we did a program together uh, when our first Flying Dog beer um, came out. We made a beer in partnership with the museum and Flying Dog uh, using Civil War era recipes uh, and talking about just kind of the, the beer magic. You put these ingredients together and voila, you have beer. Um, and it is very unclear as to how that actually happened. Um, but this is a, an ancient, ancient tradition that goes back thousands of years. Um, but it is only within the last hundred and what, 140, 130 years that we actually have an understanding of how beer is actually made. So it is very important to, to, to keep that in mind. I do have a comment here, uh, uh, or a primary source, I should say, uh, from the Civil War era, actually published in a medical journal during the Civil War, kind of warning about this. And so this is what they say about kind of adulterated, as they, as they say, um, beer. This is what they say, quote, beer and ale are largely adulterated. Sometimes the process of brewing, which requires a long time to complete perfectly, is hurried by the introduction of foreign substances. Sometimes the water uh, used is taken from frog ponds or places where the sewage of cities is emptied. Uh, foreign beer and ale are adulterated with uh, other uh, grains of paradise or tobacco leaves, all poisons. Um, so other elements that could get into, uh, get into the, the beer. So the process itself is allowing this uh, kind of adulteration and allowing for uh, elements to get into the beer that can not only make it taste bad, um, but also cause physical harm to you as well. And this is not just an issue for beer. This is an issue for other forms of alcohol, uh, for food during this time period. Um, think of, you know, we don't have much refrigeration um, available during during the mid 19th century. So this is gonna be a major, major problem. Uh, for it reminds me of uh, that conversation we were having the other day uh, where one thing we hear a lot at the museum is people were tougher back then. It's like, no, they weren't, they died. They were always running a low grade fever. Like <laughs> there's many people who die in, in, the, in the past. Uh, I was listening to this archeologist the other day and he was saying that most people of the past have no descendants today. People died a lot. Everyone was mildly poisoned in the 1860s. Uh, we can't understate how unsafe it was to live back then compared to today. Yeah, it is. It is an incredibly dangerous time when you look at the medications that are being used regularly, the mercuries, uh, all of these different uh, things that we recognize as poisons today are because of medical knowledge that was available in the mid 19th century. They're being used medicinally in ways that ultimately lead to lead to the, the deaths of of many, many people uh, who with you know, the tools available in modern medicine, and even just the knowledge, not even that, not even the medications that we have, but just if they understood that using things like mercury uh, were bad for your health and could poison you, uh, if that would have been limited, it would have saved countless lives during the Civil War and in the decades that followed as well. Uh, Beer, though, does have positive sides. Um, and, and we've talked a lot about the negatives, we've talked a lot about the intoxication factor, we've talked about the moral side, um, we've talked about the adulterated uh, beverages and, and foreign substances getting in. But it is important to recognize that beer did have a, an extremely valued place in American society at this time. Um, and that goes back to uh, even before the Civil War. Uh, we talk at the museum a lot about what was in the water in America uh, during the 19th century, not just during the Civil War, but especially during the Civil War. Uh, the water was dangerous to drink pretty much everywhere. Uh, and so beer, because of the nature of how it was produced, um, could provide you a more safer way of getting uh, hydration, a uh, safer way of getting nutrition in some cases. Um, and so this is where we see beer coming into medical use during the war. And when we start to look at some of the primary sources, some of the, the uh, 
what doctors are writing about beer in the Civil War era and how it is being used, uh, this is where we see its value really come, um, really come to the surface. Um, one of the things that I was astounded by kind of looking in uh, actually the Sanitary Commission records uh, from, the, from the Civil War to see how frequently and how much uh, beer was being uh, counted among the supplies available through the Sanitary Commission. Uh, so I pulled a, a couple of examples here. Um, one case we have a Sanitary Commission uh, record um, of, let's see here, they're using this on the Mississippi River. Um, this is uh, one of the ships uh, up and down the Mississippi that is carrying sanitary supplies down to the area around Vicksburg in 1863. Uh, one of these ships on board had 1,008 bottles of porter uh, available. Um, so porter is another one of the uh, one of the beer styles that is going to be available. So there's a thousand bottles of porter on board this particular uh, vessel as it's making its way. Another one, this uh, ship identified the city of Alton um, traveling between the area of the front line at Vicksburg and Memphis, Tennessee, um, was carrying, uh, let's see, uh, eight half barrels of ale on board. Um, so another, uh, another example here of, um, of alcohol being used, another form of alcohol, uh, of beer um, that is being consumed. Uh, and then another ship, uh, or in this case, actually at, at Gettysburg, um, the Sanitary Commission reported having given, turned over more than a thousand gallons of ale and cider uh, to the U.S. Army for medicinal use uh, during and after uh, the Gettysburg campaign in that area. Uh, so beer had uh, a place, an official place uh, in the medical care uh, during this time period, during the Civil War. Uh, and that uh, is for, for a number of different reasons. But before we get into that, I, I want to throw it over to Kyle just to see, I know I've been talking a lot here. So do you have any any comments, thoughts on, on, on this so far? Well, I was about to ask what beer is being used for medically, but <laughs> I also want to give a quick shout out to uh, Michelle Luklich. I hope I'm pronouncing that correctly for becoming a member uh, during this stream. Uh, we appreciate, again, any support uh, that, that you can give, especially as uh, we scale back our hours, as we have to stay safe and closed for a good portion of the week. Um, so again, consider becoming a member. Uh, check out the link below. Uh, we also have a um, uh, an ask if you want to just give, uh, or you're already a member and you want to keep supporting these, keep these videos coming, uh, then consider uh, making a donation to the museum using the links below. Um, but again, thank you, Michelle, for becoming a member. Uh, that's that's exactly what we need to keep these videos coming. Yes, thank you so much. And uh, another way you can help us too, just if you haven't yet hit that like button, hit the uh, thumbs up button. Uh, you can do that. You can subscribe to see more videos. We're going to be doing more on YouTube uh, and share the video as well. That helps more people to join in the fun uh, and uh, and learn a little something about Civil War medicine. Uh, so going back to how beer is being used, I want to go back to that uh, that original article that I mentioned kind of at the top talking about intoxication, go back to Samuel Gross. Uh, again, very important medical figure uh, from the Civil War time period, one of the best medical thinkers of the time. Uh, he did think there was a place for beer. Uh, he mentions it specifically um, in that it could provide uh, sustenance could provide hydration in places where water and food in other cases may not be uh, something that is practical or even safe to utilize. Um, so this is what he says, quote, the use of bad water, even for a short time, is invariably productive of mischief. The tea and coffee should be of good quality and well prepared to preserve their agreeable flavor and their soothing and refreshing effects. Lager beer, ale, and porter, if sound, again, going back to our adulterated beer that we talked about just a bit ago, are both nourishing and wholesome if con consumed within judicious limits. That's going to be the key, within judicious limits. Um, he goes on to talk, as many people did in this time period when they talked about the alcohol consumption in the armies, to talk about 
just how much less alcohol is consumed in the American armies, Union, Confederate, than was consumed in European armies at the time. Uh, there, uh, most American writers are going to talk about how drunk and intemperate and intoxicated the armies of Europe were in comparison to uh, American armies. Um, that's something that they come back to time and time and time again. But this is in, not just in a, a kind of general health way um, that beer can be used uh, as you know, to, to provide nutrition, uh, to provide, um, in some cases, hydration. There is going to be some very specific ways that beer is going to be used. Uh, in fact, in actually some specific cases that are going to be mentioned during the Civil War. Um, Coming across uh, patient case reports and case studies in the medical and surgical history uh, and in other medical journals of the time, you'll oftentimes come across references um, to the use of beer in the treatment of patients, uh, whether they have disease, uh, whether they have been wounded in action. Uh, and as they're beginning their rec recuperation, in many cases, beer is going to play a role uh, in their uh, recovery and then the treatment that they're going to be given. This is one example um, of, a, uh, of a sick soldier um, who is going to be given uh, beef tea, uh, think of it as essentially beef broth um, that is going to be given and used throughout the Civil War. Porter uh, was also used in his case to try to get the stomach, his stomach to actually hold down some food because um, Again, in many of these cases, these soldiers uh, and some of the other medications they're being given, uh, they're vomiting, they're having diarrhea. The idea of giving them some beer, uh, some beef broth is just to try to get their stomach to hold down, hold on to some of that nutrition. Um, in other cases, uh, wine, brandy, beer are going to play a role uh, and are going to be given to soldiers who are specifically suffering from gunshot wounds. I found this in a, a study um, that was being done, a, a lecture that was given um, after a study was done um, during the Civil War era. Uh, and in this lecture, uh, he goes, the, the professor goes down through the different ways that a soldier could be treated uh, and brought back to health after a gunshot wound. Um, he actually talks extensively about how to give opium uh, and how to safely give opium. Uh, he preferred to give it in morph morphine form uh, or in opium pills. Um, but then he goes on to talk about uh, the importance of wine, brandy, or beer in beginning to uh, get the body to hold on to some of that nutrition because in many cases the patient couldn't move. In many cases he couldn't hold on to any solid food as well. Again, vomiting, um, diarrhea because of the intense shock that th those patients have gone through and some of the treatments that they're receiving and the infections that in many cases are coursing through the body, wine, brandy, and beer, beer specifically being mentioned in there as being given to these patients and important to give these patients in order to give them a chance uh, to survive. Um, let's see here, one more, uh, one more line here and then uh, we'll, we'll start to wrap up because we're, we're getting close to our time here and want to give you all the opportunity to hear a uh, sneak peek of what's coming. Um, this goes back to another, another doctor's report on gunshot fractures and their use, uh, the use of beer and other stimulants alcohol um, in the treatment of, of those gunshot wounds and in, as the patient begins to recover. It says, quote, in many cases of gunshot fracture, stimulants become necessary after a time. The best by far in most instances in which there is profuse separation is good malt liquor, which not only acts as a general stimulant and tonic, but also as a decided anodyne. Frequently, a glass of ale at night will have a greater effect in quieting the restlessness of a severely wounded and debilitated patient and producing sleep than a dose of morphine and with great advantage of not destroying the appetite or constipating the bowels. So beer, Civil War medicine, they go hand in hand. Um, and so... Uh, with that, I'll, I'm going to turn it back over to, uh, to Kyle, uh, talk a little bit about this cool project we have. Also, if you all have any questions, we haven't talked about this. If you have any questions, please 
feel free to use the comments section. We're happy to answer any questions. Uh, if you have any comments about beer uh, in the Civil War or just beer in general or what you're drinking right now, uh, feel free to add that to the comments. But uh, Kyle, what do we have in the offing at the museum? Well, we're, uh, as you mentioned earlier, we, we do occasionally have partnerships with local institutions uh, to release special labels. Uh, Flying Dog being a big one. Um, we worked in the past with Brewer's Alley. Um, I mentioned at the top of the program uh, that we do have a special label with, or had a special label with Antietam Brewing. Uh, Antietam Brewing it has uh, kind of a Civil War theme. Uh, they have a Little Mac IPA. Uh, this is the Witness Tree Brown Ale. Um, and in the past, we've done a uh, India Pale Ale, an IPA with them uh, called Canister. Well, we're happy to announce that uh, there is going to be sort of a sequel to that. This is a mock-up. This may change before uh, it's actually released, but the beer is brewed. It's done. Uh, it's being canned and labeled and will be released any day now. This uh, partnership with them, some of the proceeds do go to us. Uh, of course, they're doing all the work, so uh, they, they get some too, but uh, it does help to support the museum. Uh, so if you enjoy IPAs uh, or you just want to uh, have a fun way of supporting us, uh, after this has been released, you can go either to their tasting room uh, or you can come to our museum and buy it at uh, the gift shop. Uh, once we've got those in. Uh, so this is the first time we're announcing this publicly. Uh, Double Canister IPA by Antietam Brewing uh, par in partnership with us, the National Museum of Civil War Medicine. Uh, it will be released anytime now. Keep an eye on our social media feeds. Uh, keep an eye on our website. We'll make an announcement when it happens. Uh, and members do get a discount. Uh, you do get a discount on, on buying this once it's out. So again, if you haven't become a member, uh, be sure to check that link below. If you are a member, uh, please consider uh, giving just a little bit more to help us through a pretty rough time uh, and to help keep these videos coming. Uh, so that's, uh, that's our special announcement. We got double canister IPA on the way. I, am, I have to say that uh, as part of the team that helped to name this beer and its predecessor, I am very happy to see that the beer is actually being made. And I'm also very proud of the name um, Canister and Double Canister. Of course, you saw Cannons there, um, a, a name that is synonymous with uh, destruction and uh, chaos on the battlefields of the Civil War. Uh, seems like the perfect name uh, for an IPA and a double IPA um, to be made by our, our partner there. So very excited to see that beer. Um, and uh, looks like, a, look through our comments here. We have, uh, have a few. I'm going to say some, uh, we don't have any questions. So I'm going to say some hellos uh, to uh, Karen Stone, um, a great uh, supporter of the museum and a partner um, down there in St. Mary's County, uh, Maryland. Um, the Inquisitive Wanderer says, cheers, cheers to you. Uh, and to Paul Lawson, uh, Paul, thank you all so much for, for your support for our videos, uh, both here on YouTube now and on uh, Facebook. And we're excited to uh, uh, be messaging back and forth about some future projects we have in mind uh, together with some of the institutions that you work for as well. Um, very excited about the prospect there. And I do um, want to give another shout out. We yeah. did just get another donation uh, from Don Dale of Statesville, North Carolina. Thank you so much for supporting us and helping to keep these programs coming. Yes, thank you so much. You're, you're supporting our programs. You're helping us to do these kinds of videos uh, and allow us uh, to, to do these programs and to continue broadcasting live uh, from, uh, in my case, the Clara Barton Missing Soldiers Office Museum here in Washington, D.C., which Kyle mentioned earlier uh, about the museum and Frederick not being open for, you know, uh, what was what was the, the over the, 180 days 180 days uh, here at the missing soldiers office it's been even more than that so we are open for appointments here um, you can find information about that at claravartonmuseum.org but the best way you can help us at this point is uh, again as Kyle mentioned become a member donate to the fundraising campaign and for all of you who already have become a member uh, who have donated to our campaigns either this one or the ones in the past Thank you so much. We really appreciate uh, your support. It helps us to do what we do. Uh, and, and we are glad we are both uh, and our entire staff are really excited to be able to continue bringing these programs to you uh, and spreading the, the reach of the museum. Our, our social media numbers over the last uh, nine or 10 months have been off the charts across 
all of our platforms. So uh, that's in thanks in part to, to all of you for liking and sharing those videos and our other posts. They are supremely helpful to us in, in spreading the reach of the museum and truly, truly being uh, the National Museum of Civil War Medicine. So uh, Kyle, you have any other thoughts? Uh, just once again, expressing my gratitude. You've all been great. Uh, this has been fun. Uh, we got to drink some beer. We got to talk history. Uh, we got a little depressing. It was great. Yep. Just a, just another day in the life of the Civil War Medicine Museum employee, I have to say. Uh, <laughs> all right. Well, everybody, thank you so much uh, for joining us for our inaugural YouTube video. Um, like I said, uh, and, and Kyle said, we're going to be doing more of these um, in the future, and you're supporting those. So thank you so much. Um, we look forward to joining uh, joining you and more YouTube streams in 2021 and be playing around more with this and, and finding out all of the cool tools we have available to us here. Uh, but uh, thanks so much. And uh, we'll see you next week. Uh, we have some more live streams and more video programs coming to you then. Uh, some upcoming uh, topics include uh, Battle of Fredericksburg. Um, we have animals in the Civil War coming up. Um, and a, a great author at the end of the at the end of the month of December um, just announced on our website civilwarmed.org. Uh, we hope to see you on those streams, whether they're on Facebook or here on YouTube. Uh, hope you all have a great week.